So the Bible reading is from Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 to 18. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray. Well, good morning to you all once again. And please would you turn uh, back to Ephesians in chapter 6. few uh, general comments. Never ending, but victory is assured. And this week I would like to look at some particulars but we must take them in the right order because the order in which things are written in the Bible is very important and we mustn't change the order, we mustn't jumble things up, but we must take them in the order in which the Holy Spirit has placed them. So for instance, verses 10 and 11 of Ephesians 6, which say, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Those two verses come before verse 12, which reads, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So our focus must be on the Lord and his mighty power, and we must put on the full armour of God before we come to verse 12. Because if we started with verse 12, and this pretty terrifying picture of our adversary we may indeed run from the fight and give up before we've even started. Which is why we must start with verses 10 and verses 11 before we come to verse 12. And all we've got time to this, for the, this morning is to look at verse 10, where the apostle says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And my verse po first point is very simply that we are not alone in this fight. Now you might say, well, how did you get that out of verse 10? Well, it's very simple because how can we be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power if he is not with us? It would be an impossibility, wouldn't it? He has to be with us in order for us to stand strong in his mighty power. 
So we have a commanding officer, we have a good shepherd, we have the captain of our salvation who is with us in the battle. We all know that often quoted verse, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And you know, that verse first appears in Deuteronomy and chapter 31, and the context is, you've guessed it, warfare. By the way, I must emphasize that never means never. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. At no time, for no reason, on no occasion, does God leave us alone to fight this battle without him. As we read in Psalm 46, God is an ever-present help in trouble, ever-present. So that means in the midst of this battle that we are engaged in as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that may mean that you have come this morning under some great and dreadful depression. Maybe it's even a satanic depression, something that Elijah experienced. Remember after he won that great battle on Mount Carmel, he then fled from Jezebel into the desert and was so depressed that he really prayed for an assisted suicide because he asked God to put him to death. He had had enough. He had reached the end of his tether. He didn't want to live anymore. He was so down in the dumps. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Maybe you've become, come this morning, burdened with sorrow. Do you remember the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, how he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death? Maybe that's you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Maybe this week you have fallen into sin and you have come here and your conscience is guilty. You don't feel worthy to come and stand before God and to worship him. Maybe like Peter, you've denied Christ in some way, either in what you've said or in what you've not said. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Or maybe there's affliction in your life, all around your life. There are all sorts of things going wrong here, there, and everywhere. Well, the Lord says to you, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Maybe you've been criticized and condemned by others this week. Maybe at work. Maybe there's somebody there, one of your colleagues, and they're constantly having a go at you. Well, do you remember Moses and the grumbling Israelites? Poor old Moses, as he, as he led almost two million people, he was forever being moaned at. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Or maybe you're even running from God. And you say, well, if I was running from God, I wouldn't be here. Ah, but you're here to save face. But inside and in your weekly life, you know that you are running from God. Well, Jonah didn't get very far, did he? Because never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so I could go on. In the battle that we are facing, in the hardships that the evil one brings into our lives, God is with us. We are not alone. A woman who had been suffering all sorts of losses in her life went to a doctor for sympathy. And of course, doctors should be good at sympathy, shouldn't they? They should be able to understand our trials and tribulations. Anyway, she went to a doctor for some sympathy. And after being in his study for some time, she suddenly exclaimed, I've got it, I've got it. And the doctor was quite surprised and immediately asked what she had got. And instead of answering directly, she pointed to a card he had over his mantelpiece in the office with two words on it, thou remainest. And she said, that's it. I now see that no matter how much I lose, God remains. And that is enough for me. We are not alone in this fight. A young Scotch student in a university was rooming with an old Christian auntie who read her Bible and believed it. 
Now we've got two things there, haven't we? She read her Bible and believed it. And we need those two things. And one day the student came home and said to her, Auntie, you know that verse in Hebrews that you so often quote, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, I have found out today that there are five negatives in the Greek in that verse. And it reads like this. I will never, 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 never leave thee. Oh, said the old lady, one never is good enough for me because he said, I will never leave thee. I believe it and therefore I do not fear. So in the battle that we are fighting, that is hard, that is never ending, we are not alone. Our good shepherd goes before us. He is with us. He is behind us. Do you remember that verse in Psalm 23, that lovely verse? Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Not just some of the days of my life, not just when things are going well, all the days of my life, no matter what those days may contain and how dark they might be. He is over us. He is underneath us. He is round about us. And even when death strikes and we are in our final hours, he will not forsake us. Let me ask you, if you think you can escape from the presence of God, where can you go to escape that presence? Do you remember the psalmist? Where can I go from your spirit, from your almighty spirit? Where can I go from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So we are not alone. As the great Augustine said, God is an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Now that's a bit of a mind bender, isn't it? I better say that one again. God is an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Ah, we may not see God, we may not hear him, we may not feel him, but he is ever present. Therefore, be strong in the ever present Lord and in his mighty power, because we are not alone in this fight. Secondly, it is the Lord who is with us. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We are talking here about the Lord God Almighty. We are talking about the omnipotent one, the one who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, the one who poured out those 10 terrible plagues upon Egypt, the adversary, when that land was attacking his people, the one who just with a word opened up the Red Sea that his people might walk through on dry land and the enemy behind might be swallowed up, the one who then sustained his people for 40 years in the wilderness where their clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on their feet. You try wearing the same shoes for 40 years and see what happens. And yet how wonderful the Lord was to look after them. We are talking here about the one who healed the sick and raised the dead. The Lord. Be strong in the Lord. We are not talking about some useless idol or even the gods of the nation or the Russian army. We are talking about the Lord God Almighty. Be strong in the Lord. Who in one night put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp who were attacking his people. It is the Lord who is with us, mighty in power. Listen to the words of Nebuchadnezzar. And if anybody should know about power and might, it was that king. He says of the Lord, his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. In other words, he does what he pleases with you, and he does what he pleases with me, and he does what he pleases with the evil one. 
who is seeking to destroy us. No one, says Nebuchadnezzar, can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The Lord is with us, the one who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, whose plans can never be thwarted, who accomplishes all that he pleases. I ask you, who has ever defeated God? Who has ever overturned his plans and his purposes and his desires? Oh, no wonder the Apostle Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power because he is the omnipotent one, the all-conquering one. Just consider these verses for a minute. You can follow me if you want. They're all taken from Isaiah, almost taken at random. But first of all, in Isaiah 40, because I just want to show you that the Lord that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you a picture of the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Well, who is he? This is who he is. Isaiah 40, verses 25 and 26. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Or Isaiah 41 and verses 10 and 11. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Or chapter 43, verses 11 to 13. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no saviour. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Chapter 44, verse 6. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Verse 24, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and who spread out the earth by itself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers. And on and on I could go. Chapter 46, verses 10 and 11. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. And on and on I could go. Just describing to you, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And we can have absolute confidence in him and in his mighty power that it will not fail and he will not let us down. Therefore, we look back and consider his works. We look up and consider his character. We look forward and see what he will do next. The enemy may look strong before us. And when we come to verse 12, boy, oh boy, does he look strong. But how feeble he is before the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Oh, the Lord is with us. We are not alone. That is why we can say that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that is why we must fight and be men and women of faith and courage. That is why we need not fear in this battle, because Christ is our sufficiency and our hope and our strength. Be strong in the Lord 
and in his mighty power. And that leads me to my final point, an exhortation for us to be strong and courageous. This is a very common exhortation for the people of God. It's to do with warfare. God speaks these words when his people are about to go into battle. Be strong and courageous in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, we are not here talking about natural courage because not many of us have natural courage. We're talking here about supernatural courage. We're not talking here about man's strength, but we're talking about God's strength. We must know two things. We must know, first of all, that without Christ, we can do nothing. That, that we are not equipped in and of ourselves to fight against the evil one. We will lose every time. He will destroy us. But with Christ... Nothing is impossible. I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. And how we need genuine confidence and faith in almighty God and a personal and real knowledge of his mighty power. Can I say those two things again? I think they're so important. How we need genuine confidence and faith in almighty God and a personal and real knowledge of his mighty power. Just consider these men for a minute. How on earth did they manage to do what they did? Was it simply in their own strength, in their own courage? Of course not. Think of Jesus, for instance. From where did he get the strength and the courage to take on Satan and to overcome him, to take on sin and to overcome sin, to take on the world and the establishment and to overcome them. How did he manage to set his face as flint to go to Jerusalem where the cross awaited him? How did he manage to lay down his life as an atoning sacrifice for sin and to suffer the wrath of God? How did he manage to do that? Well, Isaiah and chapter 50 and verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, they tell us ever so clearly. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting because the sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. What about Moses? How did Moses, one man, who a few years earlier had fled from Egypt, how did he manage to confront and overcome Pharaoh and the whole nation of Egypt? How did Samson, where did his strength come from to overcome the Philistines? What about this little boy David overcoming the great Goliath? Or Elijah, how could he face 850 false prophets and overcome them? Or Jeremiah, who stood against a nation of rebels, or Jonah, who preached against the great city of Nineveh. You know, Jonah gets a lot of criticism, doesn't he? Don't forget, he wrote his own book, Great Humility of That Prophet, that he went to the great city of Nineveh, he preached a great against it, and a mighty revival broke out. How did these men manage to do these things? Be strong and courageous in God's mighty power. Some years ago, I did a study on the great Welsh preachers down the ages. I read a great deal about them, biographies and so on. And what I noticed is that two words kept occurring again and again in descriptions of them. The first word particularly surprised me. It was the word energy. These men had incredible God-given spiritual energy to keep preaching the gospel, sometimes several times a day, seven days a week, and traveling in, the, in between time. Now we can just about manage once a week and we're knackered. These men had this tremendous energy. But the second word, 
courage. Courage. Men who were prepared to suffer anything for Christ, to go anywhere, to do anything. And how they very often set up their pulpits in the very midst of the enemy's territory. Let me share you one example. This man wasn't Welsh. But nevertheless, he was a great man, Roland Hill. If you don't know anything about Roland Hill, go out and search for Roland Hill. He's the man in between George Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon. He's on a par with those two. Let me read you just one little anecdote. On one occasion in this area, that was in the area of Marlborough, Roland Hill preached on a village green to a large crowd who became very wild and threw every kind of missile at him. Did he flee? <laughs> of course not. His subject was the power of the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. And just as he was speaking of the attacks of Satan, one member of the crowd released a live snake into the congregation to frighten the women and interrupt the worship. Roland bent down and quietly picked it up in his handkerchief, convincing his hearers that their fears were groundless. He placed it beneath his feet and said, this is one of the darts of the wicked one, but faith enables me not to fear. His assailant was so impressed by the preacher's calm manner that he listened carefully to the remainder of the sermon. Afterwards, he went up to Roland and acknowledged his offensive behavior and became a devoted Christian for the rest of his life. One man's courage brought another man to faith. When John Knox was laid in the grave, the cry went up, There lies he who never feared the face of man. If only that could be said about me. When Martin Luther was called before the Diet of Worms, his enemies demanded that he recant his writings. Luther, although he was in great personal danger, boldly declared, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Then looking round on the assembly, which he, which, <clears throat> before which he stood and which held his life in his hands, he said these famous words, here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. May God help me. Amen. Now, you may not know what happens next, and I'm about to tell you. The assembly apparently was thunderstruck, and the emperor, the emperor exclaimed, this monk speaks with an intrepid heart, and an unshaken courage. I ask you, where has our courage gone? Why is the church today so wet? Why do our knees wobble and our hands hang limp? Why do we so often run from the fight? Have we forgotten to be strong in the Lord? Have we forgotten his mighty power? Have we forgotten who he is and who we serve? It pains me to say this, but I believe it's true that we do not know the Lord as we should. And our faith in our omnipotent king is so pitifully small that it has made many of us cowards. And I put myself in that category. But God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Oh, may God give us the grace to know him and his mighty power. Remember those words that Paul said to the Corinthians? 
Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. Be strong and courageous in this battle, knowing two things, that the Lord is with us, the Lord is with us, and he will never forsake us. Let us pray together. Oh, gracious God, we do pray that you would give us a much greater understanding and knowledge of who you are and of what you have accomplished, of your character, of your works. Oh, gracious God, we pray that you might open our eyes, that we might see you as you really are, and that you would give us the strength and the courage to fight this battle with all our might, standing strong in your mighty power. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.